Network to the world. Subscribe now to the Hot 97 YouTube channel. It's Ebro in the Morning with Laura Styles and Rosenberg. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, you have it on Ebro in the Morning. You have Rosenberg, you have Laura Styles. Give it up for the, the amazing mayor, uh, Keisha Lance Bottoms. Mayor Woo-hoo. Bottoms, how are you today? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Mayor of Atlanta. So uh, we have a lot to get to today, but uh, most recent was the long lines uh, when people were voting. And voter suppression is real everywhere, uh, and specifically in your city of Atlanta in Georgia. I think I read there were 80 different locations that were shut down because the Voter Rights Act had been gutted at the Supreme Court level. Can you articulate what you're seeing and dealing with? So I've never seen anything like this. And I've been voting since I was 18. And this was unbelievable. We even saw it in the early vote. So there was um, a lot of consolidating the precincts, elimination of precincts, even before COVID. And then with COVID, it was supposedly because we didn't have enough people who could man the polls, which again, goes against everything that we know about COVID. You shouldn't try and get a, 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 a great number of people in small spaces. If you anything, we should have had more precincts open. Mm-hmm. And then on top of that, people were in line for six, seven, eight hours just for early voting. I personally requested an absentee ballot that I never received. And I even had a cousin who called me on yesterday who said he showed up at his polling place where he's been voting for over 30 years and was told that he had been purged from the voter roll because he's a convicted felon, which is not true. So people have to know voter suppression comes in all types of forms. It comes in the form of propaganda coming into our social media feeds, um, feeding into the narrative that our votes don't count or we somehow have to look for perfection with our candidates. We saw that happen in 2016 with with outside interference. They've gotten even more sophisticated because now they're speaking with black voices using, um, you know, language that resonates with the black community. Um, It comes in the form of making it difficult to vote and also in purging people from the voter rolls. So again, going back to the presidential election in 2016 where Hillary Clinton lost Michigan by 10,000 votes. We cannot stay home. This election is too important. And whatever your your differences are with with Vice President Biden, who's at the top of the Democratic ticket, he runs circles around the man who now occupies the White House. And we can look at what's happening on our streets and, and see that this man does not care about anybody but himself. So we got to show up in November and make a difference. Um, Mayor Bottoms, do you feel, uh, speaking directly to what's going on in the state of Georgia, do you feel Governor Kemp stole the election in Georgia by using voter suppression because he was overseeing voting at the time? You know, there's certainly um, there have been a lot of questions about that because of obviously a a conflict. If if you are overseeing the election uh, while you are part of the election, I I don't think it's a stretch for people to think that that there was a conflict. Um, But again, what I know is that a lot of people didn't show up to vote. So whatever happened with voter suppression, because it's very real. We still have to do our part to register to vote and to show up and vote because I know um, even with that race, there was we didn't have the the numbers um, that we should have had based on the number of people who were eligible to 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 register to vote and to show up and vote. But how do you encourage people to keep having the uh, wherewithal, the 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 energy right to continue to get? You know, I show up and vote. I don't see results. I don't maybe I didn't show up and vote, but the election seems like it got stolen. Like we continue to see these same issues, which is why I think people are in the street tearing things up and and being very frustrated and protesting as well as uh, defacing public property and yanking down statues. And all of these things are happening is because we're all saying, look, go vote. I get to vote. 
things that things are broken and not working. Like who's holding Governor Kemp accountable? Who's making like we don't have we have run out of options as voters to trust that there is truly a checks and balance system in this nation. Like we are watching people commit crimes and say loose things from their public platforms. And there is no what seems to be for right now, zero accountability. What I would say is that that is the beauty of this country. No matter how many times we get it wrong, there's still an opportunity for us to get it right. And the last thing that that we need to get into our psyche is that we've run out of options because then we give up. And I, I quote Audre Lorde quite a bit. Her, her words are so beautiful and prophetic. Revolution is not a one-time event. And so if you think back to the civil rights movement and some people will say, oh, that was a long time ago and it doesn't matter, but it really does It really matter. does. It really does. Because history is repeating itself. And you think about how that movement was organized and they didn't give up. Um, there were a series of things. They didn't give up at the lunch counter. They didn't give up crossing that bridge at Selma. They didn't give up with the Montgomery bus boycott. There were a series of actions that led to reactions that got us to where we were with, um, during that movement. And what I would just say to, to everyone, I get the pain and the frustration and the anger and people lashing out. What most concerns me about that is that the message is going to be lost in the destruction because then we get distracted and we start talking about other things. And this is not about loving property more than people. It has nothing to do with that. But if our message gets lost in the violence and the chaos, then we're not moving forward. We're not pushing forward. We've got to keep our heads and our cool and calm about ourselves so that we can be thoughtful about what our next steps are. And in America, that next step is exercising your right to vote. And we know we've seen the elections where there's been an undervote, particularly in the African-American community. We showed up and we voted for, for President Obama and Vice President Biden in record numbers in 2008. We haven't shown up that way again. We didn't show up and in 2010, and that's how we lost the House and the Senate. Absolutely. And people have to recognize it's not enough just to show up when, during a presidential year. You've got to show up and you've got to vote down ballot. You've got to vote for every single race on that ballot because every single race matters and you got to show up each and every time because what happened in 2010, we didn't show up, we lost the Congress, and then it, it made it that much more difficult to push forward um, this agenda that was so important, especially to black and brown communities. Mayor Bottoms, um, prior to, to becoming mayor, uh, you served in all three branches of government and there was a tweet that you posted um, back in November that said, I lost my first election for public office 11 years ago today. I felt hurt, confused, and hopeless, but I now count it as one of the best failures I've ever had. Uh, I want you to talk about the major changes that you brought to Atlanta. And um, I we spoke to Kamala Harris, and you know, obviously you are one of the names that's being thrown around for VP. And um, I wanna know what your focus is, what you want change, what if, if elected, what are your main focuses? So one of my favorite scriptures, many are the plans of a man's heart, but it's the Lord's purpose that prevails. And in 08, when I lost that race, I was devastated. And, and I was confused because, uh, you know, I'm having my conversations with God about when you told me to run and I listened and I did it. And now I'm sitting here as a loser. Um, but after that race, during that race, I got a chance to go to communities all across the city and see what effective leadership looked like. I turned around, I ran for city council, and then eight years later ran for mayor. And, and here I sit talking to you about what we're doing in Atlanta. So criminal justice reform is something that's very personal to me. I've talked publicly about my dad's incarceration and addiction and how it impacted and shaped my life uh, going from, you know, 
ballet classes on the weekends to visiting my dad in prisons across his state and how it broke our family. Um, and just watching my mother struggle as a single mother and, and my story is the story of so many people. But it's the reason why when I came in, one of the first things that I pushed forward was the elimination of cash bail bonds in Atlanta. And for people who don't understand what that means, it means if you get stopped for a, a broken tail light, if you had $200 to pay the fine, you could pay it, you'd be out in an hour. If you didn't, you might sit in our city jail for three months. Right. And that story is a story that I've seen a lot repeated in my family. And I know people across our communities have seen it. So that was the first thing. Uh, we eliminated uh, or we ended our relationship with ICE during the family separation crisis at the border. We were getting uh, millions of dollars a year to hold ICE detainees in our city jail. And we didn't wanna be complicit in that policy. So it then put us in a, a position um, after we eliminated cash bail bonds, eliminated the relationship with ICE, that we could begin to reimagine the transformation of our city jail from this place of mass incarceration in the heart of our city into a center of equity, health, and wellness. Mm -hmm. And we've been working with our community partners to really lay out a plan to close this jail having a place where we can have 24 hour daycare, where we can have some supportive housing and job training and GED training, substance abuse counseling, all these things that we know are needed in our community. We just took another monumental step in that we've moved out roughly 60% of our corrections budget. We're moving it out of the corrections department into another area so that we can really begin the transition um, that mass incarceration model into a community-based model um, that's really impacting and changing our communities. And I think that really is the, the, the topic of conversation that's going to be transformational for our country going forward, that our domestic agenda has to be heavily focused on criminal justice reform but also what it means for our community. So you said, you mentioned I served in three branches of government. What I saw as a judge is that we either pay for crime on the front end or we're paying on the back end. When I'm seeing men and women come into court who, who don't have a high school diploma and any hopes for getting a decent job, they make other decisions. So we're either gonna pay to lock them up or we're gonna pay to make sure that they're getting what they need and their families are getting what they need, what they need so that they can truly feel a part of our communities. Um, Mayor Bottoms, one of the main images from the first night of national protests is you at the podium in Atlanta um, with Killer Mike and T.I. And it was a very powerful moment, the whole thing, as, as we're seeing protesters outside of, of CNN Tower. Will you just take us through what that night was like for you, when you were alerted to kind of what was happening and deciding to make, did you personally make the phone call to Killer Mike? How did that stuff play out for you? So, you know, that was a really interesting day. I spent the majority of the day preparing and testifying before uh, Chairman Clyburn's committee on COVID-19 because, you know, the backdrop of, of all that we're seeing is this pandemic that, that's still very real in our communities. Um, I'd taken a break, gone up, uh, gone into the kitchen. I'd start frying fish <laughs> uh, for dinner and I, I turned on the television and we're used to very peaceful protests in our city. And it was very clear to me that this was taking um, a turn. So I rushed down to our joint operations uh, center. And at some point, um, and I, again, I, I'm always thinking about my kids and I know my kids don't always listen to me and I don't always speak the language um, that they understand. And I called someone on my team and I said, you know, we, we need to get some people down here who people will listen to because I could look at the crowd and I, you know, it was a very young crowd by and large. Um, and at some point I was on the phone with T.I. I can't remember. 
um, who called him, but I got on the phone with him. Um, he found Killer Mike. We were trying to track him down and we called Bernice King and some other folk to come down and stand with us. And when I went out to the microphones that evening, I didn't know what I was going to say. I, I called myself going out, just kind of giving an update. And everybody just got it straight from my, from my heart. And even when I was finished speaking, I didn't know what I'd said. I knew what I felt, but I didn't know what I had said. I had to come back home and watch it. And the interesting thing on the back end of that, um, when I got home around midnight, my 12 year old was really upset that he had missed fried fish. <laughs> and I sit in the kitchen and I fried another batch of fish and made some grits for my kids because that night had just been such an emotional night watching everything that was happening. And I, I knew for as unsettled as I felt, my kids felt even more unsettled and I needed to make them feel like everything was normal. Um, but, you know, the thing that, that comes to me repeatedly, and I, I had a really rough night last night, I just keep thinking about the murder of George Floyd in front of all of our eyes and so many other names that we can call. Ahmaud Aubrey, Breonna Taylor. Um, and that night, all of that Friday night was on me. And on top of that, just seeing what was happening to our city and you heard me say when Dr. King died, we didn't burn down our city. We, we faced it in a very different way. And it is, um, you know, when you, you look at Atlanta, you look even at these job centers in Atlanta. The other thing I knew, a lot of these businesses were owned by African-Americans, a lot of people, uh, who work in many of these places are African-American because it's Atlanta. We have a huge African-American population in this city. And I just knew the, the murder of George Floyd was being swept under the table because we weren't talking about that. We were just talking about the destruction that was happening in our city and, and the point of our anger and frustration and pain was, was being lost. Um, Mayor Bottoms, um, that night when we saw people outside the CNN building, did that have anything to do with CNN? I was told that the Atlanta Police Department has offices or headquarters in that building also. Is that true? There is a precinct, um, a mini, what we call a mini precinct in, in on somewhere in that complex. That's a, a really big complex. Um, there's a hotel attached on, or not attached, but right on the other side, there's a food court, and uh, um, there's a mini precinct in there. And so uh, the reason I asked that question is because, you know, how much of what we saw with that backdrop had to do with uh, energy towards police specifically? And how much, in, in your investigation and working with your team, how much of the destruction and things going on were actually young people from the city versus the rumors we've heard about where a lot of this uh, upheaval came from agitators outside. So what was interesting about Friday, again, we have protests in Atlanta a lot, but this protest, um, it looked different, meaning um, just physically, it was a more diverse crowd than we normally see. It was see. more white people. Yes, it, it, it looked different. Um, and on top of that, it we don't usually have these type of confrontations. And even Friday night, we had organizers of the, the Peace World protests calling and, and coming down saying, this is not us. We don't know who these people are. Mm. We don't recognize them, never seen them before. Um, and so a lot of this is anecdotal, but I believe it because 
you know, people who who organize the protests are saying, we don't know who these people and are. You know, and you know those people because you they're grassroots organizations. They are. And the footnote to that, they often don't agree with me. Um, so, you know, for for them to to come to me and say, hey, that's not us. We'll know what's going on. I thought was even more profound because they're often protesting me, too. And so it was just it was there was a different element. We started looking at the numbers to see how many people were actually in Atlanta that were arrested. And, um, you know, we ha have a metro wide area. So the numbers were not as high as I expected. But clearly there were people in this crowd doing things that we hadn't seen done in this city in a very long time. The, the main image I remember that night is they kept showing the, the CNN building, and I don't want to just label one person, but there's this white kid with a skateboard who's the person actually breaking the glass. And I just found it to be striking. Um, it seemed it, it seemed like, is that person really part of the protest or is this an agitator? Yeah, it was, it was strange. And even I, I, I caught a glimpse of a kid, and it, this was a separate story, but he's got some bolts unscrewing the wheels on a police car. So there was just a, there was a lot going on that I knew what was not Atlanta, meaning this is not how we air our grievances and, and resolve our, our conflict in this city. And have you been happy I mean, with how it's been since? I'm, I'm so grateful that the peaceful protesters, now let me be clear, it doesn't mean that the anger and, and the frustration is not still there. Because when I went out there in the crowd, I mean, I, I got it every which way to Sunday. It's still there, but it's not taking this, this violent form. People are doing what they should do. They are articulating what they are angry about and expressing their grievances. And, and, they, and even someone... Um, a, a very dear friend who led some of the student movement uh, pro, um, demonstrations in uh, the 1960s has told me to stop calling them protesters, call them demonstrators. She said, because you with each time you give a negative connotation to who they mm. are, it perpetuates this negative connotation. Mm. She said, they're not protesting they're demonstrating. Mm. So I'm reminding myself of that. And so now people are demonstrating and the message is not being lost in the in the chaos. Well, didn't it help the tone too? the the officers that uh, tased uh, the, the young man and, and girl in the car and broke out their windows and yanked them out of the car? Those officers, I mean, it, it had to be less than 10 hours between the time I saw the image and the time I saw the news headline that they had been, uh, two of them had been fired. And then maybe it was a week later that six had been charged with one thing or another. Um, do you believe that your swift response also helped people see that you're not playing on both sides? I think so. Um, you know, that was, it was disturbing to watch that video. And I, I saw it played again last night. Every time I see it, it just, it physically makes you cringe because you're watching two young adults being tased and you can see the agony and their pain. And then it just, you know, really, it ticked me off um, because this is what this uprising has been all about. And, and, and here we are perpetuating what people are demonstrating about. And so, you know, the reality is we have some really good police officers on our streets. And um, that night was a chaotic night. People were stressed, police officers are getting shot at and people were frustrated. It was a lot going on, but that in no way gives anybody permission to abuse their power. Um, and to lose their cool. It, it's not for our officers to lose their cool. When all, the, when all the madness is going on around you, that's when you've got to be even more calm 
and even more together because then you become a part of, of the madness and chaos and that's what we saw with the college students. The the one of the police uh I don't know if it was the chief or um I believe it was a white lady who's a, a top cop in in Atlanta mm-hmm. said that she thought that the swift action was politically motivated. Have you responded to that well, at all or she, had a I believe yeah, so what she was referring to, the district attorney, um, who's separately elected from from the mayor's office, um, he's actually the county district attorney, he charged the office, he made criminal charges against the officer very quickly. So uh, what she was referring to were his actions and her belief that it was politically motivated because he was on the ballot on Tuesday and is now in a runoff. Um, What was extraordinary about that is that he has several files sitting on his desk of police misconduct that haven't been acted on. Got it. So she was specifically calling out somebody who's been a part of the problem in the district attorney. He's never, he hasn't been active in making sure this sort of thing was handled. And now all of a sudden you want to be swift. Well, I, I think that's what she was. Uh, that's what she was trying to articulate. Now, do you believe? Um, and this is a conversation I'm having frequently. Do you believe that there is uh, any sort of white supremacy, Nazi, or KKK activity that permeates the Atlanta Police Department? You know, I've never heard that with respect to the Atlanta Police Department. Um, I, d- I did hear it with respect to some of the folk who were out on the street, that we had a combination of groups who were infiltrating um, the the demonstrations. Uh, but I've, I've never heard that as it relates to APD. Got it. Because I do believe that, you know, there was a there was an FBI study about this about 10 years ago. Um, and I don't know if anybody has, you know, at the mayoral level or any city council level enacted any sort of reviews of officers of personal affiliations with hate groups um, because you often hear about it. Even here in New York City, we hear about it. And I've asked, I've asked the police chief here about it um, because we know it permeates society, right? Like we, we know it's a part of the world we live in. So how far removed could it actually be from our police departments? Yeah, so, you know, part of um, what we've tried to do in Atlanta is make sure that our police department is part of the fabric of our community so that the first interaction is not when somebody's getting chased down the street. And part of the reason um, when we even looked at how much we were paying our officers, we want to be able to choose from the best there is to offer. And we also want officers who can afford to live in Atlanta in the communities that they are um, charged with working with, Um, not policing, but working with, because the reality in Atlanta, the last numbers I saw, saw, roughly 80% of our police officers don't live in the city of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. And many of them would say it's because they can't afford to live in the city of Atlanta which is part of the reason we've been pushing on affordable housing in the city. I set a $1 billion goal for affordable housing in the city of Atlanta and to create and preserve 20,000 affordable units by 2026. And so it's, a, you know, the, the issues of policing our communities and partnering our communities. And even as my 18 year old told me, about the demonstrations. He's like, this isn't just about black and white. This is about rich and poor. Mm -hmm. There are equity issues. You know, there's a lot that has, has, um, that we've been angry about and frustrated about that's bubbling up to the surface. And I think that policing is just one part of it, but we just created an advisory committee met for the first time yesterday. President Obama uh, gave out the charge to cities Take a look at your use of force policies. The Obama Biden administration left this great blueprint on policing in the 21st century and how you create meaningful relationships with your communities. And what I would say, it was probably left next to the pandemic handbook that the Trump administration didn't bother to pick up (laughs) and read. So the interesting thing, the attorney, Molly Davis, for uh, the two college students, 
um, who were tased, he's on the advisory commission. They're gonna make recommendations on all of our use of force policies. But I think this is really, this is this peeling back of all these layers and really an opportunity for us to succinctly articulate in the same way it was done in the 1960s, what are our grievances and how do we see um, the solutions taking shape? Is one solution to defund the police? You know, I think that's a that's a, a very challenging conversation. I think what, and I'm just going to show you my visual here. Okay. This is my city of Atlanta budget book. This is a thick binder. And so it's not that simple. That's a, a very simple tagline, defund the police. The bigger picture is how are you spending the money in your budget? And again, when I look at the tab in this binder book on police, I'm looking at salaries, pension, uh, workers' compensation, capital costs. I'm not looking at fluff in this budget, but you also got to look in here and you got to see what are we spending on equity? What's our housing authority spending on affordable housing? Um, how are we reallocating our corrections budget? to make sure that we're putting money towards community-based programs. Teachers and, and education. Teach it, well, again, Atlanta Public Schools is a completely separate entity mm. than the city of Atlanta. So if you looked at my budget book, you would think I don't care anything about education. <laughs> we're not doing anything about education, but the reality is that's a completely separate budget, which a huge part of our property taxes in the city of Atlanta go to fund public education and that's why I say it's not as easy to just say defund the police, because unless you're looking comprehensively at every um, government budget and quasi government budget, you're not going to get a full picture of how we're spending our dollars. You're not going to even see. I think that's why the tagline is there, though. I think the, 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 the hashtag started because of what's going on in Minneapolis and what's going on in L.A. specifically, and shout to the Black Lives Matter movement in L.A. And what it was is a challenge. While it is a statement, it wants the public to realize that your tax dollars are going to fund organizations that are also abusing people. And you should be challenging your city officials to articulate to you how your tax dollars are being spent to fund these individuals who are not being transparent and not, and I'm not saying Atlanta, I'm just learning a lot about Atlanta, uh, but all across the nation, are they being transparent? Are they being held accountable when, um, when crime happens uh, from police officers, are they getting charged? Um, and if they're not, why are your tax dollars going to support this? Your city and your officials should be challenged to do something different. And and again, I think that's why it's important. But I'm, I'm so glad that we're all getting informed so that we can have these very important and thoughtful conversations. So, again, if you look at my budget book, you don't see our Center for Workforce Innovation that we are doing in conjunction and that's being supported by the corporate community with Delta Airlines, Home Depot, Georgia Power, where we have partnered with our Atlanta Technical College, where we're training people for jobs as linemen that pay $100,000 a year or to fill 10,000 of these mechanic jobs at Delta Airlines. You're not going to see that reflected in my budget book, but the real work is happening because there's this partnership and this belief that unless we give people options on the front end, we're going to be paying for it on the back end. And what my challenge to people across this country is simple. That knee was on George Floyd's neck for almost nine minutes. For those nine minutes that that knee was there, register nine people to vote. Just call up nine people and say, hey, are you registered to vote? If not, send them the link. Let them register to vote. You can do it online vote. in most states. Also, get nine people to fill out that census form. Fill out that's the goddamn census, people. That's how money flows into our community. Serious, that's how man. it's decided who gets to represent us in Congress. And then... 
put nine things in the email that you have a problem with in your community and send it to your mayor and send it to your city council people, your local elected officials. Because a lot of times we sit around and we complain and we discuss it and hash it out in the barbershop and the hair salon and it doesn't get anywhere past that wall. It doesn't make it to my desk. So if there's an issue in your community, just take nine things, quick email, send it. And then that way, nobody can say that they didn't know that this was happening on our streets. And I think if anything, in response to these lives that have been taken before our eyes, there is an opportunity for us to take action to make sure that in this terrible, terrible period of grieving in America, that we've taken action and, and you heard George Floyd's brother ask for action. And I think in the same way, we can do the same thing just from the luxury of, of, of our smartphones and our laptops. Uh, Mayor Keisha Lance Bottoms, she's a VP possibility. Do you want to be VP or do you want Stacey Abrams to be VP? Or do you want Kamala you know, Harris to be VP? You're number two on the CNN polls, by the way. Number two, Keish. Can I call you well, Keish? You know, <laughs> yeah, that's that's what my godmother used to call me. Keish. Keish. <laughs> um, I want Joe Biden to put on that ticket, whomever will help him win in November. And if it is my one of my little puppies running around in the yard that will help him win, that's who he should put on the ticket. So the reality is that he has an array of, of talented people to choose from. Um, I'm going to trust that he's going to make the best decision. I mean, he knows this better than anybody. He was a VP in the most progressive administration that this country has ever seen. And I trust that he knows what a good VP should look like and feel like. And um, I, I, I trust that he's going to make the best decision. Uh, Mayor Bottoms, they telling me we got to wrap with you because you have a city budget meeting. So hopefully that city budget meeting, uh, wherever y'all choosing to spend your dollars, um, the community down there in Atlanta is in, is in firm approval of you. It seems like the city really loves you and you're doing a phenomenal job every time I see you on socials or I see you on television. It's a pleasure to meet you and thank you for coming on the program. Well, I appreciate it and look forward to chatting with you all soon. I'm sure this conversation oh, no, we got work um, is going to do. be a lot more fun we than got, my budget we, conversation. <laughs> we got work to do. Thank, thank you. you. Thank, thank you, you, Mayor Bottoms. Appreciate it. Thank man. you.